Okay, good enough. We can begin. <clears throat> okay, so uh, normally uh, these teen weekends, since we started in 1996, um, the, uh, the afternoon time would be a time of uh, taking the, the teens up into the, into the forest and uh, having uh, some time of solitude and uh, just being <clears throat> out in the forest um, on your own and uh, um, in a yeah in a natural environment and what's natural today is is uh, blistering heat so it's not much fun fun and uh, so we're going to uh, do our uh, uh, our afternoon program uh, here in the in the hall, and don't really have um, a whole lot of uh, uh, say clarity, ideas, uh, opinions of how it should be. Um, but I think if we and take the opportunity. I thought what I thought I'd do was uh, <coughs> just give a bit of a, uh, uh, an overview or a, a, a sense of, of uh, why uh, I think the uh, say practice in the forest is a is a good thing, and uh, and then uh, just plant some seeds for reflection also uh, hopefully people will have questions and uh, and we can uh, uh, just engage in some discussion and and uh, have some uh, ideas of what uh, or even what we even do in a monastery like this people uh, probably uh, have some have some questions uh, so being out in the uh, in the forest, of course, this is called the Thai forest tradition, and uh, <clears throat> it's something that is definitely not um, unique to Thailand or um, um, uh, or unique to um, uh, um, say a somewhat modern time. It's something that uh, since the time of the Buddha. Um, that uh, uh, this uh, uh, practice and and lifestyle has been going on in in uh, uh, secluded areas and and uh, and it's something that the Buddha uh, praised um, taking time to be in quiet places, being in secluded environments, being away from away from the uh, uh, busyness of uh, even a, a village life. Um, all of the, uh, um, uh, let alone city life. Uh, so being <coughs> able to step back from, from uh, the various um, entanglements and, and uh, uh, duties uh, that one one has and uh, all the different kind of webs of relationships that that one uh, one has, and uh, being able to step back and then be in a uh, a simple environment of of, uh, of nature, and and that gives a an opportunity to see a bit more clearly. Well, what what's my mind doing? Um, <clears throat> what does it feel like? Uh, when uh, there isn't somebody to talk to, somebody to to phone, to text, to uh, uh, some device to check uh, what's happening, uh, even if it's just for a couple hours, uh, and uh, and of course uh, that uh, that's say part of our uh, our. Uh, <clears throat> Life here is is uh, 
uh, when somebody comes to uh, uh, to the monastery and they want to commit to being here, one of the things that we ask them to do is to uh, uh, give up their social media accounts, give up their devices, and uh, and uh, be ready to to just live from day to day, moment to moment with, with themselves and with the community that they're training with. So that's a, uh, um, that's a part of a, a training that helps one to start to see, well, what, is, what does my mind do? Where, how, what, what's the nature of this attachment? Because it's easy to sort of say, oh, yeah, I'm just mindful and unattached. And so long as you're getting what you want, and then it, everything's fine. Um, but as soon as that, there's any kind of obstacle to that, then, okay, there's a problem. And, uh, and, it, uh, and it feels uncomfortable. Uh, and what, uh, you know, I'm just starting feeling kind of antsy or uncertain or uh, having that, that feeling of, of uh, you know, what do I do? Uh, and uh, and of course, uh, being in a a, a quiet um, environment is is a, is just a <coughs> uh, and, uh, 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 it's a it's a backdrop to the activity of the mind, and uh, you start to be able to see more clearly. Okay, what's my mind actually doing? <laughs> And so that spending time in, in, in the forest, and for probably a lot of you uh, have gone camping, gone hiking, and, and uh, uh, you know, those are generally times when you, you do step back from, from, uh, uh, f- from one's uh, sort of so-called normal life. And uh, and then that uh, um, uh, and it, people obviously see the benefit because uh, I mean places like uh, REI and North Face I mean they they keep doing well you know <laughs> <laughs> so there everybody can, at least they buy the equipment I don't know what they do with it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, so that as as uh, uh, that sort of I say like a forest monastery is very much a, a place where where one's surrounded by by uh, by nature and that's uh, uh, say like up until you know, yesterday afternoon uh, then uh, for the previous I think. 10, 11 days, um, I was on retreat. Here at the monastery, we, we uh, during the uh, um, summertime, during the wintertime, we have a three-month period of retreat where we really step back and it's kind of a group practice and we have time for solitude, we have time for uh, group practice, focusing on meditation and the teachings. Uh, but uh, in the summertime, uh, we'll, uh, we'll have uh, uh, a shorter period, so we usually have two weeks of of, uh, of solitude, and uh, uh, so that um, say my routine up until last night uh, was that I would, you know, I'd get up in the morning and I'd do some exercises, meditation, and come down, and I'd have they take leave some breakfast in my, in my, uh, uh, my office, have a, have a cup of tea. There would be some odds and ends for, um, for a meal. I'd put it together, just some vegetables and fruit, uh, get on my treadmill, do, 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 uh, do some, uh, walking exercise, have a shower, head up the hill. And I'd, be on my own uh, through to the next morning, and even in the morning, I don't really, don't really see anybody. Everybody knows I'm a retreat, so they, they tend to leave me alone. 
and uh, it's delightful. <laughs> really, uh, uh, that opportunity just to to uh, step back and and uh, meditate and and read and and reflect on uh, on the the Buddha's teachings and on the on practice. So um, these are. Uh, uh, aspects of, of, say, our life, the rhythm of our life. Um, a lot of it's in community, uh, but then there's also time for, for solitude. And, uh, and even during those times of solitude, um, the, uh, I remember one time, I did a, a, a year uh, uh, of retreat in a monastery in England and uh, in the forest and I would n come down to the I would very have little contact with with people I'd been in retreat for about six months and uh, um, and a, a, a Thai woman who I, I know and been a supporter of the monastery there for a long time she saw me came over and chatted for a bit and uh, and then asked me what uh, what, what do I do? I mean, if you're in retreat in the forest, what do you do? So I sort of gave her an outline of what my day was, which is you know, just meditation, yoga, reading, meditation, yoga, reading, have some tea, have a meal, and, uh, and sort of day after day, week after week, month after month, and she she looked at me and just, isn't that boring? <laughs> and uh, I said, no, not at all. And, but it didn't, it, it wasn't until after that I started reflecting on that. You know, why isn't it boring? Because uh, on the outside, I mean, I'm not doing anything interesting at all, apparently. Um, but uh, you know, just reflecting and sort of thinking, well, you know, so much of our boredom it's just you know when we're at, we're not mindful, we're not present, and we're looking for something else to fulfill a feeling of need or a feeling of of something, something else other than this present moment, uh, who who we are, uh, and so that and that's that's actually the story of our lives. We're constantly looking for something. And uh, to be able to uh, just have a, a a time to to develop that clarity of of awareness, where one's actually content with with uh, with what one is doing, what where where one is, who one is, and uh, that's a huge uh, uh, gift to oneself. So that that. Uh, uh, and even say coming up for for the teen teen weekend to come up and and uh, step out of your normal lives and and uh, uh, take the time to be in a a place that, that uh, by say by worldly standards uh, yeah it's, you know, how how much more boring could you get than going to a monastery <laughs> but it, it uh, there's these uh, 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 the opportunity is opens itself for for uh, for something else. It's actually, you know, learning, investigating, understanding, understanding oneself. So this is part of the the uh, say yeah the benefit of of having um, say quiet environments to. Uh, both for ourselves, but then also for others. I mean, in that, uh, um, yeah, Abhayagiri is a great monastery for ourselves, but it's also the way monasteries work is that they're, they're open to anybody who wants to come. And uh, they're, uh, and because we, um, because we function on um, generosity in the sense that um it's everything is is supplied and supported by uh, people's 
offerings and generosity, then uh, it's also a reciprocal relationship where we offer the place and the opportunity for um, people who want to want to come and spend time, and uh, so it's freely available. Um, something that 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 uh, uh, reminds me that I did want to mention uh, has come up a couple times, but the uh, uh, something that that we are also is available freely available are um, uh, publications, uh, books, and uh, audio, uh, which are because all of that's on our website, but then also the physical books and CDs are in, there's a room right um, in this, where all these chairs are, there's a room at the top there that is, all the all those uh, publications are there for free distribution if anybody's uh, interested. Um, help yourself, uh, take back what you want. Um, it, uh, they're there for for uh, uh, for people to to uh, to use and to uh, uh, to study from as you wish. So the uh, that's just some ideas I'm tossing out to to reflect on uh, or to consider, and uh, just wondering if there's. Uh, people have questions or would like to uh, ask anything that, that uh, help clarify what uh, 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 any doubts you have or uncertainties, uh, questions. Yeah, Leo. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Strikes. What is the most meaningful impact like Buddhist monks have on the community? What do you think that is? Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that's a really interesting question because I think, uh, particularly from a uh, uh, say Western um, Protestant perspective, in particular, uh, and America is fundamentally a say a Protestant culture. Um, you got to be doing something. And um, and is based on works, and and so that uh, um, uh, so then yeah on paper then it looks like yeah we're not doing anything, and but you know I think one of the uh, the things that that uh, is lacking um, are real clear examples of. People who are living, a, um, say, a peaceful life, a harmonious life, uh, a, a, a harmless life, um, and uh, and that example is something that that is certainly worth bringing into the world and and being here, uh, and as well as the uh, um, the that opportunity for. Um, again, that, that, that you create a place or a space that people can enter into and, and uh, participate in. And, uh, because I think the, the, the general perception of, uh, say, of a monastery in, in Western culture is one of inaccessibility, uh, sort of walls or, or like m- many people uh, even though we've been here in Redwood Valley for for 20 years and still the locals will will ask you know oh, can you can you go there oh can you can you go in and 
because it's, it's a, the, that's the assumption, is there are monasteries or places that you can't actually go into. And, uh, and that, uh, that's very different in, uh, uh, say, like in, in, uh, in Thai culture and, and in Southeast Asia, um, monasteries are, are, are very much a part of the uh, kind of the web of the uh, fabric of the, of, of the society, of the culture, uh, their community. Um, um, centers, uh, and and that's also why, uh, say, like forest monasteries are important because then it it does step out of the the whole community, communal, village uh, um, uh, 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 impact, and then they can people can step out from that. But it doesn't mean pe people uh, can't go there. Uh, and people do go there. They're going there all the time. Uh, so a place like I remember the very first time that I uh, went to stay with with uh, uh, Ajahn Chah, um, my teacher. He uh, um, was fairly soon after I arrived. To, to I was just visiting. I. I'd ordained, I'd taken a temp, my idea, I was taking a temporary ordination just to learn a bit more about Buddhism. So that was 40 odd years ago. And, and uh, uh, because similarly, that like um, um, uh, I was living at a monastery, practicing meditation, studying, um, and uh, uh, one of the monks Asked me, are, what, are you going to uh, uh, are you going to ordain? And it was sort of, to me, it was a strange question. It was no, no, no. I was just traveling. And no way I could ordain. Uh, I couldn't live like this for the rest of my life. And because my per, that's my perception of okay, a monastery. You go to a monastery, you have to live there for the rest of your life. I mean, who would want to do that? And uh, so then he just looked at me funny and sort of. No, I mean it's ordinary in Thailand to just you know, for a month or three months, four months. Uh, that's uh, you know that's really ordinary. Just take a temporary ordination. So I thought, oh, three or four months, I could do that. So that uh, that was the extent of my commitment. But then I uh, that was in it was close to Bangkok, and then I started hearing about forest monasteries. I said, oh, okay, I'd like to. Check that out. So you're hearing about Ajahn Chah, so I go and visit that monastery. There was something that was pulling me. And and then shortly after I arrived, it was a full moon in February, and uh, um, in those days, that was the time when the the different, there weren't that many branch monasteries in, in that day, but that, still there was a, starting to be these satellite monasteries affiliated with Ajahn Chah, and there maybe about 15, 16 of them. And uh, so they would gather, uh, and then all the lay people would gather. So there was, gosh, there was a couple hundred monks, and, and then all the uh, uh, lay people, Hundreds and hundreds, uh, and I was sort of wow, um, this is amazing. But and, and it was something that uh, was quite, uh, you know, you could sort of see this is really vibrant. And then you see on a weekly basis, the uh, the uh, lay community uh, would be, you know, coming. One, they come every day anyway. And not numbers, not so much, but on a weekly basis, they're 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 coming and and uh, uh, listening to teachings, chanting, meditating, spending the night uh, in the monastery, and then leaving the next morning, so that you get uh, quite a large number of 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 people uh, in the monastery. Uh, so it's like, 
And so it's just freely available. And even say like a place like uh, you know, right now, Wat Nana Chant, that's an international monastery, a branch monastery of Ajahn Chahs. And on a, uh, <coughs> on a regular basis, there's probably, I don't know, on a daily basis, 40, 50 people show up every day, um, plug in in the morning, um, and then uh, <clears throat> on the weekends, uh, of course, a lot more. And then if it's a lunar observance day, then then you, you hundred, two hundred people come and meditate, practice together, and uh, you know, it's quite. Uh, you know, it's very much accessible to whoever whoever wants to come. So that it's like creating a sanctuary that people can enter into and and uh, be yeah be supported by uh, and then the uh, uh, you know when you create a a sanctuary you create a, a a peaceful environment that is open to anybody and people can come and, and benefit from that because uh, even say even here where it's still a bit of a strange uh, I say culturally, it's still a strange concept. Um, we get, and people do come, and, and, uh, and certainly on the weekends and on the uh, 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 on the uh, uh, lunar observance nights, teaching days. Tomorrow afternoon is a, uh, a regular teaching. We moved. We used to be Saturday nights, and. Uh, uh, we moved it now with the new hall, then we can accommodate people. So, moved it to Sunday afternoon, and there are probably numbers of people who easily tripled every every week. Um, so coming, it's not huge numbers, but it's you know it's what it's available to anybody who wants. And uh, and then uh, and then people come, and uh, you know, there's many people come and just walk the walk the trails. Because uh, it's 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 available and, and people have, you know, there's something peaceful about it. People feel that, so it's a it's a gift to people, and uh, uh, and that and they're not not really asking for anything in return. Uh, which that in itself is a is a big. Uh, 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 at least I'm a, a, a counterpoint or a uh, alternative, because um, you know, just generally in in society and culture, there's there's such a one, especially America, is such a competitive culture, uh, and then uh, uh, and then and then you know if they're not competing, then you sort of you know what's the What's the you know, what's the trick here? You know? But it's just, it's just, it's just a you know, it's an open open generosity. So it says uh, within the uh, for for people to see that there's alternatives in their life. I don't know how to uh, take no questions at all. <laughs> Surely there must be must be some questions. <clears throat> yeah. How closely do you and Rajan Ross live together? How closely do we live together? Yeah. How much time do you spend together? Um. Well, 
Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting because um, we try to get a balance of of uh, having time together and uh, um, where we're interacting together, um, working together, and uh, having to do ceremonies together, things like that. So there's a, there's a certain amount of time on a day, and then. And then there's time to say, like in the afternoon, like right now, people have gone back to their dwelling places, and and uh, our our cabins are kind of scattered through the forest, so that we can have time of of, of solitude. Uh, and uh, so there's a, there I try to get a balance between uh, having having time together, um, and. Uh, um, because there's a there's always a certain amount of uh, there's always uh, there's always issues that come up. It's natural. It's like uh, uh, I remember Ajahn Chah saying one time. Saying so, human beings, human beings, those are beings with issues. <laughs> that, you know, we bring our issues to, together. And as I remember one monk sort of saying, yeah, living in a monastery, it's, it's easy to, to uh, uh, start thinking that uh, 80% of all the suffering in the world is because of the person sitting next to you. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's especially in our in, uh, in our monastic structure, then your uh, who you sit next to uh, is determined by the the uh, uh, the length of time you've been a been a monk. So you end up sitting next to the same person for years. Sometimes <laughs> you gotta uh, you have to figure out how to how to live with them and. Uh, and that's one of the things that, that say in a monastery we don't uh, uh, um, how do you say the the screening process isn't around some personality profile or something. It's more around are they interested? Are they willing? Are they willing to follow the the monastic routine? Are they willing to to live by precepts? Uh, and uh, uh, so that that's your your fundamental standard, and when you have that standard, then um, you get all sorts of different people showing up, and uh, and you have to learn to live with all sorts of different people, and because even if you have your time by yourself at the in the dwelling place. Oftentimes, what you end up doing is is uh, uh, taking in your mind taking people back to your dwelling place with you. Why do you say why? Why shouldn't you? Be? <laughs> uh, it's it's a very human uh, tendency. So that 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 time together is also learning how to to uh, uh, to not carry each other around and learning how to yeah to live harmoniously and learning how to relinquish our own views and opinions our own attachments as to how we think others should be how they um, how they uh, uh, you know if only they were like this and this and this then I'd be happy which is you know we spend so much time in our life, sort of waiting for the world to conform to our preferences, and uh, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> so that yeah, that that time of of being together and then being apart is 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 times for for learning in different ways. Um, that's, uh, so there is a, a certain amount of, and there is a, uh, a certain amount of effort that we put into our communal living, uh, into learning how to to uh, 
interact harmoniously and uh, and that uh, that takes work takes attention um, I think our uh, um, as uh, um, say as Westerners we don't really have a, cu a strong cultural value of uh, uh, communal harmony. Um, there's a strong value in competition and and uh, and uh, and being in individuals, which you know, has its benefits, um, but it also has its drawbacks in terms of uh, learning to live together. Like it's really interesting in the kitchen seeing you have a large group of Westerners and you have a group a large group of Thais how they move around each other they're they're they're, they're smooth <laughs> and it's a cultural value that they have and that they're uh, both in terms of just actual physicality but then also in terms of, of speech and interactions they tend to be. It's not that they don't have conflicts. I know the language too, so but they're really good at dodging. <laughs> yeah. So I know you said that when you first got ordained, you were just doing it to learn about Buddhism. Yeah. Right. So what changed for you that made you decide to fully dive in? Um. I think one one of the things that that uh, I mean, there's a couple things that happened. One is the uh, just internally uh, the experiences that I had in meditation um, that uh, really kind of shifted in terms of wow, this is possible. There's really another possibility other than my confused, wretched mind, <laughs> and uh, so that that was that was a big deal. But then also uh, meeting a teacher like Ajahn Chah, uh, seeing somebody who really embodied uh, that, that, that uh, um, yeah, peace and freedom and awakening. Uh, so you know, those two things together were, were, were very important, very, uh, very instrumental in making that, that uh, and it wasn't I wasn't really conscious at first, uh, uh, and in fact, it was sort of uh, you know you can you're always kind of hedging your bets. How can I get out of this? You know, because there's part of me is sort of like, oh wow, yeah, I should really just give myself to this and forget about anything else. And then there's another part of sort of saying, you know, okay, how do I get out of this? How do I <laughs> How do I, how do I gracefully you know, make a departure? <laughs> but uh, you know, just increased confidence, and uh, and uh, um, it was also interesting that that uh, the very first time that I like the very first morning that I arrived at Ajahn Chah's monastery and paid respects to him, which is what you do when you arrive at a new monastery, paid respects to the teacher, the abbot, and paid respects to him. I finished did my bows. And, uh, and then uh, he just sort of looked at me for a bit, and was, looked at me for a bit, and I'm kind of not. And then he said, you want to stay? You want to stay with me? You have to stay at least five years. <laughs> that was his. That was the introduction I had to Ajahn Chah. <laughs> and it was sort of like you know, it's just five years, no way. <laughs> but you know, he just pushed my button. He was he's incredibly good at, at that, that. He just knew where our buttons were. <laughs> and uh, and you know, of course that that reverberated in my mind over time where I'm staying with them. And and, uh, and at first five years, because at first I was just going to, oh, I'm going to pay respects to this well-known teacher and and uh, I'll go and do this and do that. And I, so I, and I did, I went off and, and uh, after, I don't know, a few weeks maybe, 
then I went and and uh, uh, stayed at a uh, uh, um, a meditation monastery where I could do exactly like I wanted. I wanted to do solitary practice. I wanted to do to uh, uh, to be really focused on on this meditation and. Uh, I didn't really want to live in community. I didn't want to live in... Um, but then, uh, as I kept practicing and kept meditating, and I, and I got good results, but I just kept thinking of Ajahn Chah. And then it was after, I don't know, six months, and it was sort of like... Because I kept extending my time as well. And so it was after six months, I go, Okay, five years is five years. You got to go back to, you got to go back there. <laughs> Neil. How are you going to go see your coaches? Not today. I think tomorrow we'll go for well, tomorrow we'll go for a walk. Tomorrow morning we'll go for a walk. Take people who want to go for a walk and. And see the uh, see the monastery. Uh, it's a uh, yeah, an opportunity to. And we were very fortunate, um, as we uh, you know we have this uh, really pristine environment to live in, and uh, we. Uh, we are here because um, you see where these, these these themes of generosity come around. Where um, we're here in this place because there was a, the abbot of a Chinese Mahayana monastery. Uh, he was getting close to uh, his death, he passing away, and uh, and he uh, offered. Um, us, uh, like 125 acres of land to start a monastery. He'd been, uh, we'd had contact, uh, mutual contact back and forth, mostly Ajahn Sumedho, um, uh, 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 and, but the rest of our communities had, had time uh, where we exchanged visits and spent time in our, each, commu each other's communities. And, uh, um, but as he was approaching his death, then, then uh, Master Hua, the, the, the teacher, the abbot, um, uh, offered uh, 125 acres of, of land. So it's actually the adjacent parcel to this one. It goes up the mountain that way. And uh, it didn't have anything on it. Didn't have any buildings, didn't have any water, but it was a start. and. Uh, and then they, uh, so it was was a uh, a gift that uh, uh, we thought. Well, you know, he's as a, and the land looked really rugged. And so what are we going to do with this? So I thought, well, we'll just rent a piece of property nearby and see if we can develop it, see if it's possible. And uh, so then he started checking around to see if there's a property close by and then this property which is right adjacent to it was was being rented out to somebody so we figured out okay who owns it and uh, they went to the, the, the board and uh, Ajahn Amaro went to talk with the person who owned this property to see if we could re rent it when the current renters left and uh, and he said, well, actually, no, uh, I'm, I'm just drawing up the papers to sell it. So you can either buy it or forget it. And so they negotiated a price, uh, which in those days was incredibly reasonable. Uh, and it's another was a really adjacent parcel of another 125 acres. So it, uh, uh, and it, the, this property had a small house on it. For some of the people who've been here before, you've seen the, the uh, 
there was the old house that was was in the middle there. Uh, it was just a little bungalow, uh, but uh, it was enough to start. And uh, and what is and where you'll have your council this afternoon. Um, that was a that was a garage, and so it uh, it's been fixed up. And uh, so that was what we started with, and we've been sort of developing it. And it's it's uh, it's just really uh, the land lends itself to to say practicing meditation. It's qu- incredibly quiet. The the forests here in California are really really quiet. I spent all all my monastic life in Thailand, and and uh, um, tropical forests are noisy. <laughs> you know, it's just a lot going on. Everything's alive and competing with each other, and there uh, uh, so that uh, uh, insects and birds and you know everything, uh, the wildlife uh, is amazing. Uh, you know, there's a lot going on, so. Here is just there's a stillness that's in the forest. It's part of the nature here, and also because it is really rugged land, then um, you said wherever you can find a flat enough spot to build something, then uh, then we can uh, we build our our dwelling places, and that gives uh, you know certain separation and and uh, and again the ruggedness of the land. You're sort of all. Even if you're fairly close by, you can feel quite separate because you're kind of it's you're down around or you're around a little knoll or something. Up there. Yeah. The hardest thing to give up. For me, the hardest thing to give up was for family. Um, uh, uh, close, close family, uh, various close family ties, and uh, uh, and not just with uh, with my parents and siblings, but uh, a sort of extended family. So that was uh, that was a big thing. Um, I can remember um, well. Early, I was. Uh, I hadn't moved here to America. I hadn't even thought of that then. It was, it was probably 1993 or something. And uh, um, a Thai woman invited me to uh, accompany her and some of her relatives, plus a couple senior Thai monks. Uh, she'd wanted to take them to Canada, uh, so I said, "Yeah, um, I'd love to go. I can visit my family. I can visit uh, other uh, relatives of mine." And so we uh, had a uh, itinerary, and I had relatives everywhere, and I just checked in with them because I, 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 I didn't uh, when I went to uh, live in Thailand. Um, and ordained as a monk. I didn't get back to Canada for like 16 years, over 16 years. So it was a long time to be away. Uh, so yeah, for me it was family. For others it would probably be something different. But uh, Yeah. So I asked this to Autumn Jim for a little while, but there wasn't that much time. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And um, a law was passed of making it illegal to collect rainwater. Uh-huh. So it was like the cost of water went up 700%. Yeah. Uh-huh. And everyone was basically had to work for the for Nestle. Yep. Um, and that would, would that count as taking what's not offered? Um, well, I mean, that's... 
it would, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's how they, uh, that's how they make their money. <laughs> that's why they're an incredibly wealthy multinational corporation. Uh, that's how it works. Uh, but that's also, uh, um, you know, there's things that are, are legal, uh, and then there's things that are maybe moral. You know, and, and uh, you know, you have to be really careful uh, how you start, um, you know, because you can't sort of interpret things on your own all the time. You need to have some kind of, because uh, 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 also say like, uh, Um, say when I lived in Thailand, and then there were, you know, I you know, get involved in. There's because there's so much more contact between the monasteries and the society, the culture around. Then a lot more involvement in social issues, uh, and 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 monasteries tend to be looked to as guides for for uh, you know on social issues. Um, so that uh, uh, you know, involved in in things like that of of resources that are are uh, are public and and are are being uh, intruded upon by by people who are businesses or, and uh, so that how to uh, uh, make. Um, to, to advocate for people who don't have power uh, against people who do have power. Uh, uh, that's a, uh, uh, those are, are issues that, that, uh, that certainly I've uh, you know, dealt with. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, um, you know, learn from. So that yeah, certainly those are, are aspects. A lot of what I what I was involved in were were, were things of uh, like protecting land, protecting forests, protecting the, the local resources, uh, because outside businesses were coming and and buying up things, or uh, were coming and logging, um, or uh, stripping the land. And, uh, so it uh, helping to organize people. Mm-hmm. I guess recently I've been thinking a lot about like activism, but like based on like the precepts and yeah. with yeah. the Buddhist foundation. Yeah. Um, yeah. And how that would look like in, in societies where there's like a lot of unjust, you know, the water supply is bought up and privatized. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a, it doesn't matter which society, there are lots of unjust things. And, and uh, you don't have to go very far in America to, to find what is unjust. Um, so that that, uh, but a lot of it is is uh, uh, being able to, because there's a lot more power in like a, a harmonious, virtuous foundation to go against. Um, it's hard for people to, uh, especially when you can pull people together around that. Um, then uh, oftentimes people will will you know, will back down, or they especially if they're because it just makes them look so bad. <laughs> uh, but you have to be really careful. You have to be really discerning. And that's the uh, you can't just because you think you're right doesn't mean anything if you if you're. Uh, 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 
the the uh, uh, the uh, uh, you you also have to be um, be able to have kind of yeah like a harmonious support or foundation that people can accept, and that's really important. So that uh, say a lot of what I was doing, and it's also just you know learning how to say you know how does it work? How how does it? How, what are the power dynamics here? So I remember one time, I was just starting a, uh, I'd been offered this piece of land, really beautiful forest, and, and uh, start a, uh, 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 a branch monastery because I was wanted to protect that land. And then, uh, uh, and I'd gone and looked at it, and then uh, came back to uh, bring some monks to stay. And uh, there's chainsaws going, and they're they're, they're cutting down these areas of of just pristine, um, like first growth area of hardwoods, and uh, and it was right near the spring that where we were would would have been would be our water supply, and uh, so I go and and. Uh, Talk to the, uh, the 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 cutters and you know and the cutters. I mean, they're just trying to get by. And so talk. Okay, who's who? Who hired you? Who's who? You're working for. Okay, it's the kind of the, the head man of this, the the village. And I said, okay, when's he come and get his law? So I go and see when he comes. I go and sit out on his the pile of logs that are that are waiting to be picked up. And, wait for him to show up and start talking to him, saying, you know, this is, I'm going to be, this land was just given to me. And uh, and it, where, where he was cutting was actually in National Park land. And, uh, but that was one of the things that, I, that was a way for me to protect this National Park area, because it was right on the border. And, uh, uh, and so I started talking with him, and and uh, and he sort of said, "But uh, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I, I can't stop now. I've already, I've already, I paid off the police. I paid off the forester already. I'm in debt, so my." <laughs> yeah, that's how it works. And he said, "Okay, how, what are the power dynamics?" And and then uh, you figure that out, and then. Uh, uh, okay, uh, who's, who, who isn't on the take and who isn't involved? Who would be interested to help out? And, and, and at, this, at that point, then I was, uh, uh, I was able to find a, a, a senior military officer who was, 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 he was really clean, he was, uh, but really wanted to help. So he was able to stop. But so you got to figure, you got to take time. You can't say, "Well, oh, it's the wrong thing to do," and you get into a fight with them, because they got it. And especially in that area where I was, I mean, it was, it was like they've they've got all the guns. And I remember telling the monks, you know, don't obstruct anybody, uh, don't don't go in there, and especially some righteous kind of Westerner coming in and trying to tell them to get lost. It's a good way to get shot. <laughs> so I to, you just have to figure out ways to, to, to do it. And so we're able to, and it take, of course that takes time. And, and it did take time, and we were still able to protect it. It's still protected to, to, to this day. Why don't we have a little break? I see people are, are uh, uh, need a little bit of a, a bio breaks as well as just a little bit of a walk. Uh, Ten minutes, come back. Okay. Okay, so we've had a bit of a break. There was a couple hands going up just before the break. Has anybody 
still have the questions? Yes. Myself? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think one of the, probably the biggest advice that I'd give myself would, uh, a lot of it is, you know, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry, don't, don't sweat the small stuff. And that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's such a, uh, um, a tendency for all of us. I mean, we all have different 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 habits but uh, you know I think for myself my my own habit and tendency was around worry fear doubt and so uh, yeah just uh, that sense of it's not worth it you know there's obviously some healthy concerns that one should have from time to time but uh, um, but Still, um, you know, we, we tend to get overly worried or overly concerned, and uh, you know, we've got the uh, we got the means to to deal with whatever. Yeah. What were you like when you were a teenager? What was I like when I, you have to ask some of my friends? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I was like uh, probably most normal, well, not really, I mean, in the sense, most normal 18-year-olds, probably, uh, uh, that, that's a, uh, that isn't, uh, it's not easily defined. And, uh, you know, I think for myself at 18, um, confused, um, Uncertain what to do is just going off to university, um, you know, trying this, trying that, and uh, um, but but also, uh, you know, I think there was you know there was also uh, something that was was really internally sort of pulling me somewhere other than what I was having to deal with or put up with or, or, or uh, you know, in the sense that I was really looking for uh, an alternative. Uh, so that, that, was, that was something that was going, percolating underneath all the time. And uh, yeah, I was, uh, you know, at 18, all sorts of, uh, you know, just the, the normal things of, of uh, Wasting time. Uh, Eighteen uh, hadn't started into drugs yet. <laughs> uh, well, in those those days, it wasn't, and where I came from, just wasn't around. So that made up for it after. <laughs> but uh, but you know, just. Uh, and, Typical sort of, especially for growing up north, uh, where I grew up, a lot of alcohol it just is uh, part of the part of the culture, and uh, trying to figure out how to have a girlfriend, how to keep a girlfriend, how to get rid of a girlfriend. Just, <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> you know, it's the, it's just the typical. Typical stuff, you know, where you're just confused. Yeah. Actually, I've, I've never heard, I don't think I've ever heard of anyone talking about that. As far as like wholesome relationships, like romantic relationships, mm -hmm. I don't think you're like, yeah, I guess I've never really heard any of the teachers talk about that. Oh, there's lots in the suttas where the Buddha talk, talks about what are, are uh, you know, what are the foundations for really stable relationship, stable family, stable uh, uh, basis of, of uh, communication and love within a relationship. I mean, the Buddha was asked all sorts of questions and uh, he, he gave, and he also, uh, how, to not, uh, how to maintain a relationship. It was like this couple who were 
happily married and and uh, had been married to, and together for who knows how long 50 years 60 years and then you know we've been happy all our, our lives how do we uh, how do we how do we find each other in future lives and the buddha gave advice so no, it's a it's not a uh, an unknown topic in in uh, in uh, in the Theravada Buddhist canon. You know, so much of it is is it comes back to the fundamental principles of of uh, uh, the, uh, the basis of uh, you know what is it that lays a, a basis of confidence, uh, virtue, uh, uh, a, a generosity, kindness. Wisdom, discernment; you know, those are all the qualities that are needed in order to have a, a stable and and uh, and loving relationship. So those are those are important qualities to be making conscious. I, gave, I I talked a little bit about it, uh, just uh, tangentially, um, with. Uh, no, it's just the reason I, I'm curious, particularly. I, I think it's very. I didn't know that about you for a long time. About <laughs> what an impact you've had on Thailand that was, and the, the context being that we're all living in a time of tremendous environmental, um, you know, uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's. I mean it's really uh, it is important to have a uh, like an attitude and perspective that you can hold that because uh, um, uh, if you if you dwell too much on the statistics, uh, it can be really depressing. Um, but uh, the uh, I remember one time, you know, I'd been involved and helping many different projects and then starting different projects and then remember somebody asking me quite outright because a lot of it was to do with protecting of forests and but also in order to protect forests in Thailand you also have to build a uh, a village structure and autonomy uh, so that they can they can take responsibility for it so it can't be imposed um, and uh, but anyway, uh, asking you know, you know, do you think we're going to be able to protect forests in Thailand? And I said no. I said, well, why do you do this? <laughs> you know, if you don't think it can be done, and I said, well, the thing is, 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 uh, uh, yeah, the forces for destruction are are, are really powerful, but there's there, there's, uh, you can't approach it from, from that kind of rational place. You have to pay attention to what is, what's really important for yourself and the world around you. And you have to put your energy there rather than elsewhere. And, and, and that, uh, and it's because one, does that for oneself and then encourages others and is an example for others that other people will 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 pick that up and and uh, and get on board and also i said you know in terms of the especially in terms of the uh, at that time that was probably late 1980s when that, that happened early 1990s and and um, i said you know we're, we're we're really not doing it for this generation, this generation is is locked into the uh, destruction and 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 capitalizing everything. Said, so you want to do it for the the next generation, the generation after, because they're. You want to preserve examples so that they can see that and they can be inspired by it. And 
and, uh, and, and pick that up. And that's something that I've seen. You know, so now I'm older, time has passed. You really see that in, in Thailand, certainly, uh, where the, uh, there's, there's far more uh, awareness around, around uh, um, environmental um, uh, issues. Not, I mean, just, not just around forests, but um, a, a tremendous amount of uh, interest in um, uh, stepping back from, from chemical. Because um, it's an agricultural country, and uh, uh, and the chemical fertilizers and chemical pesticides have a huge effect. And um, but there's a there's a real strong movement for for uh, um, uh, organic um, uses, and you you saw that at at uh, at, at Banya Pratib. Uh, you know, they're, they're just doing great examples. And it's, it's a school, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, kind of a residential school where city kids are learning about living, growing up in the, and living in the countryside. And it's a great, great, and it's a science project. <laughs> so, I mean, they're really learning science, but then they're really learning about food and food supply. That's quite... Yeah. Food waste and, and you know, big um, jugs of biofuel that they make from the vegetable oil for the yeah. kitchen. Yeah, there, it's really, really interesting. So there's lots of stuff like that going on. And uh, um, gosh, I was just, just read something of a, uh, um, <clears throat> a monk, Sri Lankan monk who I know, he had, he was visiting. Sri Lanka and visiting uh, a friend of his. He hadn't been. He hadn't visited him for a while. And it was up in the area around around Kandy, and uh, and he was at their monastery. And he was uh, um, uh, the a couple of the novices were were uh, out doing some work in the uh, uh, like in the grounds. And they had their uh, their upper robes off, and and uh, and I said, both of these novices had these big scars on their kind of on their back. And he said, "What, uh, what, 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 what's going on with those novices? They've got these scars." And he said, "Oh, they uh, they donated their kidneys." And. Uh, Anyway, it, it, it turns out that, that in, in that, uh, you know, qu many areas of, of Sri Lanka, um, you know, huge numbers of, of people are uh, dealing with kidney failure. And because of the chemical fertilizers and pesticides, and it's overwhelming their systems. And, uh, and the... Uh, Monastics, especially if they're like fairly young, uh, or if they've grown up in the monastery since they're young, then they haven't been exposed to the. It's like when you're in an agricultural area, and then you know pe the, you know, people's kidneys are falling apart, and it's endemic. You know, it's like an epidemic in 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 Sri Lanka areas of Sri Lanka, and uh, so that that. Uh, uh, yeah, many of the monastics are uh, uh, donating kidneys to to keep people alive, keep their relatives alive, keep other villagers alive. So it's a uh, um, you think yeah, well, you know how hopeless is that? But then, but it it be it, it what it does is also create a, a sense of the, the 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 monasteries then become. Uh, a, uh, a force for spreading that that news and setting that example, and uh, so then then there's much more understanding of how how it works. Uh, Thailand is you know, certainly you know one of the reasons it isn't just because 
they taste better, that, that there's people are are getting interested in organic food. It's because so many people are dying of the poisons that are in it. Uh, so it's it's uh, um, those are are you know that's the opposite side. You know, oh, people are are learning, and you c you can learn, and you can change. I mean, even something like uh, uh, say where maybe forests have been destroyed or have been compromised. And uh, if they're protected, e even a little bit, then they're, uh, uh, they'll flourish again. So, I mean, you went into Taudam, uh, uh, which is a place along the, uh, uh, um, along the border of Cambodia and Thailand, or, uh, 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 Burma. Uh, and uh, uh, still in Thailand, and uh, the monk who's sitting here was the abbot of that monastery. And uh, I had started that years ago because I'd seen it when it was pristine. And uh, uh, I uh, and I went back about eight or ten years later, and it's gosh, it's it changed so much. And uh, so much. And then as time went on, it was, I started to go in there and start helping out. And I, uh, you, uh, and I just talk to people and gather information. And you start getting a sense of uh, where the illegal logging is happening, where the illegal hunting is taking place. Because it really is pristine in terms of... Uh, uh, tropical jungle, tropical forest that still has elephants and tigers um, living in, in it. And, uh, and, uh, but then over time, you know, the, um, we've been um, working there, having monks stay there, getting a sense of who the, you know, where the power is, uh, how to draw other people in to help, uh, and probably the last time I went in was about four years ago, and it was just made me so happy to go in and see roads that I knew were were logging roads that grown over, roads that were areas where the the hunters would would go out to to, to hunt. They were grown over, and so that. The forest is 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 just sort of coming back, and and uh, and if you do that, then of course the especially that Daudam was because it really is pristine. Then those areas of forest can can uh, and and wildlife can expand, and uh, and and then people, of course, uh, the new new generation sees the sees the value in protecting that. They're really concerned that, that uh, they're losing their heritage. Yeah? What do you think is uh, the most important thing uh, we can be doing that can help the next generation in return to buying a home like how we are? I, I think a lot of it is, is just learning, learning, how to, learning how to live simply. Learning how to live simply, learning how to be content uh, with uh, you don't have to you don't have to wear a hair shirt and and you know just sort of harangue everybody. Uh, it, it's more like just, uh, the more we we learn how to live simply, learn how to attune to to uh, a certain contentment, and and then. That in itself, because it's, it's so much of it's fed by by uh, the uh, uh, um, you know, economics, the economics of desire, and uh, uh, it's really radical to be somebody who's content with little.
a lot of what I did in Thailand as well was was uh, around communication. The uh, um, being able to train people and empower people to communicate. Um, so that learning how to learning how to communicate, like especially on a village level, training um, younger people. Um, the women, the girls, how to communicate in, in to 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 officials, how to communicate with others, how to communicate uh, in terms of uh, well, radio, television, and uh, and the uh, let's say nowadays or when I was there it was more radio, television, was sort of internet is now another means of communication. Just learning how to learning how to do that. So a lot of it is to be feeling confident to, 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 uh, to do that. And then people start to connect with each other. And then that's when it starts happening, when people start connecting with each other. <laughs> A prob biggest ma misconception, uh, uh, yeah, selfish, uh, that it's a selfish thing. Uh, I think that's a, you know, it's a fairly common um, um, understanding. One that it's selfish, and one that it's easy. You know that that oh, you're just taking the easy way. <laughs> uh, you know, if you really wanted to be enlightened. You know, should why don't you do it more ch in a more challenging way? Uh, be the bodhisattva that does this and does that and does everything. So, well, maybe not. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a that's a certain misconception. But I think the biggest one around it that it, that, that it's selfish, um, only concerned with ourselves, and. Um, you know, and that was part of what I was talking with earlier, um, and uh, um, how and how much in order to like for somebody who is really selfish, they can't live here. You, you, uh, you know, to, you you couldn't live here if you were selfish, because it's just too uncomfortable and unpleasant. You know, you you're. The expectation and the reality of having to share and give and be a part of something uh, uh, is is uh, it would would be too uncomfortable. <laughs> so that that's really interesting. When I uh, I remember uh, um, there's a very famous teacher in Thailand. Uh, Ajahn Buddha Dasa, and he's not so well known in the West. Um, great scholar, great meditator, um, huge impact in Thailand, and uh, he uh, and he, he had an incredibly organized mind, so that he would take a theme and teach on that theme every week, like months, years sometimes. He did years, he took just dependent origination, he taught every week dependent origination, like years, three years, four years, just, and it was just just coming at it from all different angles. Then for some reason, it change and be some other theme. And uh, so anyway, uh, I w went to pay respects to him shortly before he passed away. I mean, like a year or so before he passed away. He passed away in his early 80s. Uh, so he was getting older. I knew he was getting older. I wanted to go pay respects. And, uh, and, and I asked him, I said, you know, you tend to, to teach around certain themes and... Uh, and I'm just wondering, as it's getting toward the end of your life now, 
what theme are you emphasizing? And he said, ah, oh, no, nah, I'm so old. He said, I don't have time to teach too much. He said, I just keep telling people, don't be selfish. <laughs> That's really sweet. And, and it really is the kind of the heart of, of, uh, kind of any, kind, any, any religious practice, any spiritual practice. Yeah, there was a hand up over there. Um, what was your greatest desire as a kid? Greatest desire as a kid? Wow, it would depend on the flavor of the week. You know, I, think. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that was probably one of the reasons that, that uh, uh, kept pulling me this way, is that nothing really, nothing really grabbed me, you know, in the sense that just didn't have this burning desire to, you know, to do anything particular, be anything particular. But I really wanted to understand. I really wanted to find something peaceful or true. So maybe that's my biggest desire. But it's maybe it's hard to sort of articulate that when you're young. Sort of, wow, I must be some sort of screwed up mess. You know? <laughs> Uh, there are, and that is uh, very, very much a part of of, uh, of our lifestyle. Um, the uh, I remember uh, listening to uh, Ajahn Sujito is one of the monks in our uh, uh, lineage, and he was uh, he was he was starting a a monastic retreat, and he's he's very droll. He has a very droll sense of humor, and uh, he said, "Well, this is supposed to be a monastic retreat, but it's not really. We're not really monastic in that sense. Um, we're 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 much more. We're, it, we should, if we're going to call it something true, this would be a a cenobitic, peripatetic." Mendicant retreat. <laughs> so, uh, Cenobitic is living in community, and uh, but um, peripatetic is wandering. So that we're uh, it's very much a part of the uh, the, uh, uh, the the tradition. And uh, um, say in uh, in our even in the West. Um, you know, our roots are, are very much. One of the monks from that ordained here, um, he's wandering around New England, has been for the last two, three years. Um, and uh, he checks in with, uh, there's a monastery, there's a new monastery there, and then another monk in New York. So every once in a while he check in with them. And, but uh, yeah, he's just sort of out there wandering without any fixed destination and uh, uh, just seeing that that's a, uh, you know, taking it on as a, as a training. Uh, because you, again, you, when you're wandering like that, um, you don't want, you don't want to be carrying too much. Uh, it gets burdensome. And, uh, and you really have to be ready to to adapt to to the uh, circumstances that you find yourself in. So, for for in our tradition, you'd need to before you start doing that. You you uh, you don't just sort of uh, get your ordination, get your robes, and then head off down the road. Uh, you really have to have a foundation in the training so that uh, uh, say like uh, five years of of uh, the uh, fully ordained monk training. So he did that. He did his uh, time as a uh, uh, Anagarkan white novice in monk training, and then uh, and then he uh, headed off. So he's uh, he's been a monk now. This would be his eighth year. And I haven't heard yet where he is right now. Because we ha uh, whatever the case, even if you're wandering like that uh, during this 
uh, period of the summertime uh, would coincide with the, say in Asia would be the monsoon season. So then you have to be, uh, you have to have a, a fixed abode, um, just the protection from the elements. And then monks here have gone just off wandering a uh, couple of weeks, is one or a couple of the monks will go. Usually I, I won't let monks wander on their own at first. Uh, you have a bit of, of uh, say, practice uh, going with others. Um, but uh, so there's uh, you know, a couple of monks who just go off, you know, go out, the, out, out here and walk up Tomka Road and come back a couple of weeks later you hear the stories. <laughs> uh, there was a couple of the monks. Uh, oh, JP, what? Uh, Titapo and Yaniko. They walked from Baigiri up to the the we had New Hermitage uh, uh, outside of uh, outside of Portland, uh, and you just you know you go with your alms bowl and. Uh, yeah, as, as little gear as possible because it's, you know, you, you're trying to get that balance where you've got enough to keep you warm uh, and dry, um, but then uh, you have to carry it all, and so you're you're careful. And then uh, your alms bowl, so then you, uh, and then every day you you. Uh, you walk for alms. One of the things for, say, for monks, we can't actually ask for anything. So um, we can't, you know, come into a town or a village or, I'm so hungry, please give me some food. <laughs> you, can't, you can't ask. Uh, you, what you can do is make yourself available for people's generosity. And uh, uh, America's great to go. Uh, to do that in because Americans will just, you know, who are you? What are you doing? <laughs> so then you can tell them. Uh, but, uh, uh, but yeah, you can't sort of uh, uh, advertise yourself or ask for anything overtly. And we can't, uh, we can't, uh, and we can't store food so that whatever you're given today, you have to relinquish. Tomorrow's another day. Uh, we don't have. We can't uh, use money, carry money, uh, so we don't have any. Don't have any money. You can't buy anything. So you really, you really are dependent on people's generosity. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, the thing is, there's lots of them. That, I mean, we've got a lot of we've got a lot of precepts, and uh, but uh, um, you know, the the precept that gets gets broken most frequently is invariably around speech, either harsh speech or gossip. Things like that. Those are, it's those are, they're hard. Whether you're a monastic or you're a lay person, those, those are hard. Uh, so those those are, are are ones that get get taken. But there, you know, there's, you know, there are pre. I remember one when I very first time I went back to, to, uh, to Canada, and uh, was visiting. Uh, I went over at my uncle and aunts, and then there's other uncles and aunts there, and my grandfather and my parents, and so everybody's gathering. And if if there's a gathering in our family, then there's there's all sorts of alcohol and whatnot. So, uh, and uh, then uh, my uncle sort of said, How "Can I get you a drink?" And I said, "Well, I've already got one. I had a." No Pepsi or something. No, no, I mean a drink. <laughs> and I said, so I've got some really good Canadian club. I said, no, as a monk, I can't, uh, uh, I don't 
don't, don't drink alcohol. He said, well, you're over here. Nobody would know. <laughs> I said, yeah, well, nobody would know, but I would know. I'm somebody. <laughs> so that, that uh, you know, in terms of uh, that, that, you know, that, that sense of, oh, well, nobody would know. Well, so that, well, what does that put oneself at? Because you have to know yourself. <laughs> yeah. For the sake of the precepts, what's the definition of gossip? Gossip, well, a lot of it is, is um, like tail-bearing and usually uh, like telling something about this person over to that person in order to, you know, either to convey something that is, um, even if it's true, uh, it is is something that is going to lift what, uh, you're trying to get yourself lifted up in their eyes and trying to put somebody else down or create some kind of division in some way. So that's a, yeah. That's a it's a good good kind of definition. <laughs> yeah. Um, in addition to that, I'm wondering if uh, the definition of gossip also includes talking about somebody who's not present uh, for entertainment value. Like yeah. Yeah, because that that because uh, it it's definitely the case in that sense of talking about somebody who's who's not not there, and conveying something that yeah is you trying to score some points for yourself in some way and, and uh, uh, at the expense of somebody else. It's not uh, yeah, it's not very uh, very beautiful. That's one of the things that I really. Uh, and put a lot of emphasis on so I think training in our community um, because it's something that I noticed that uh, say like in communities or in and say monastic communities where you know there's not a whole lot of uh, things to do that people talk and uh, and it uh, can be really corrosive. So, uh, uh, and that was, uh, well, um, Ajahn Siripanyo came and, because he hasn't ever been here. Uh, he's visited, but he hasn't lived here before. So it was one thing he's, he, uh, that I, was very heartwarming for me. He said, I really like being here because there isn't any gossip. That's a that's a good uh, that's a good working working definition or working working uh, function uh, because that's that really is uh, yeah the function of the precepts is really to to create a sense of ease and well being um, and yeah and decrease the conflict and complication that we 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 we. Human life tends to be fraught with. Also, in terms, one of the functions of the precepts, uh, you know, as precepts are being held and and being lived, um, they create a a bond of trust um, between individuals or communities, and and uh, of course that's happiness and well-being there but it, it 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 is interesting to see that the sense of trust that is 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 created and and to recognize that 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 uh, that's a uh, uh, that's a real benefit to live with living with human beings you can trust and then to to be in in uh, 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 contact with trust and to be able to generate trust
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, is there um, a space for kind of enjoyment? There's a, there's a space for enjoyment, but it's very, uh, yeah, it might not be recognizable by people in the world. <laughs> uh, in the sense that there's a... Um, you know, there's an, a, a, a real enjoyment of, of being in the company of good people. There's a real enjoyment of being uh, in environments that are really pleasing, um, uh, you know, in the sense of nature. Um, and uh, so those are, those are things that are... But, but so that, the, and, and that's actually, I think there's a certain refinement that starts to develop um, uh, around uh, yeah, enjoying subtle aspects of the human condition that, that, that are actually accessible to us all the time, and we miss it. Yeah, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is you have to remember that it's our precepts, it's not yours. <laughs> you know, in the sense that those are, those, they're not a statement about anybody else. Uh, no, they're, you know, they're opportunities for, for us, uh, for somebody who, who wants to give that a try or to, to even to use it for a, a period of time. Um, in order to, to, but it's not, uh, it's it's not a, uh, I say it's not like a moral judgment. It's more like a, a, a an opportunity. Uh, so then, uh, you know, picking them up or, uh, and it's you know completely voluntary in the sense that, that uh, I mean, you couldn't force anybody to live like this. Um, they have to want to do it. They have to want to want to. Uh, have to want to be here. <laughs> yeah. I have a question about, um, so as, like aside from like say cheating in a relationship or sexual assault, what is sexual misconduct? Sexual misconduct in, yeah, in the third precept mm-hmm. is, uh, yeah, outside of, uh, yeah, say stepping outside the bounds of a of an established relationship that one has, again, that, and, but then also uh, there's aspects of it that are around um, maybe, like, maybe like power dynamics, um, age or position, so that if those positions are taken advantage of in some way, that's, the Buddha talks about that in terms of uh, not having, uh, engaging in sexual activity with somebody what, who is a minor or who is, who is betrothed, betrothed or who is promised or is, so that there's, there's there are uh, those those bounds of of uh, um, uh, um, yeah, propriety or or. Uh, um, and say more like maybe like a power dynamic in some ways as well, where somebody is you able to m- manipulate a situation because of their their uh, uh, within a, because of their age or position. Uh, so then that, that that's something that the Buddha points to as as inappropriate, along with the the uh, uh, stepping outside of. Uh, uh, an established uh, relationship. I need to have a quick break to use the loo, and I'll be right right back.
Yeah, Leah. Uh, still uncertain. We have to put them in, and uh, and and see. We can't. We're by our calculations, a hundred percent will be uh, will be solar. But that's our calculations. Uh, whether the calculations are right or not, because um, our use of the building is still so new. Um, uh, that, uh, and then also we changed the provider. Uh, PG&E is not our provider anymore. So in that, so yeah, it's all sort of in flux. But we're uh, uh, hopefully uh, within the next couple of weeks we'll get all the the last of the solar panels up. Hmm. I I don't know. I'm hoping it's in September. Um, that was my understanding. So, is the, if you guys produce extra electricity, are you allowed to sell it back to the grid? Um, I don't think anybody can. Because I know, like, <laughs> that's that's. Uh, You get reimbursed to the point of zero. Uh, whatever extra goes to the utility company. Because there's this person in the Oakland Hills. Yeah. And she has like windmills or whatever, but she stopped using electricity. So, or no, I think it was solar. But she actually stopped using electricity. So her stuff, her uh, renewables were just going into the grid, and then she was just getting paid. Well, the, if she is, the pg and &E will fix that pretty quick. Yes, so. Huh? My birthday is July 26th. Mm -hmm. Are you a cancer? Hmm? Are you a cancer? No, no. It's a Leo. <laughs> yes. Uh, sometimes they do, um, they're, uh, if they have any skill, uh, sometimes I've been, it's, it's a very ordinary thing, especially in Thailand who, uh, uh, like especially massaging a senior monk. Um, and it's like, it's a nice occasion to be, you know, a few people sit around and massage the senior monk and it's, it's, it's a very informal time. Um, and, uh, so it's, it's a time of making connection and, and then asking questions and, uh, it's a nice time, but yeah, I've been subjected to some awful massages. <laughs> <laughs> very well-meaning, but, uh, <laughs> But, but, uh, I mean, and there are some monks who, who, uh, who, who do actually have some skill. Um, and, but, uh, yeah, so, yeah, it happens, yeah. Well, you know, one of our precepts is around right speech. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so uh, I think it's uh, it's helpful to exer exercise right speech. I mean, it's uh, it's a very unfortunate situation. I mean, I don't think that uh, um, you know whether uh, say whether one likes them or not. That's what you're stuck with right now, and that's you know learning how to to identify the ways in which one can be uh, contribute skillfully to the uh, to the people around the world or the atmosphere around because there is such a, uh, uh, a tremendous amount of fear and negativity being being generated. Uh, that I think it's important to to be consciously figuring out ways to to uh, uh, be able to uh, support each other as human beings uh, and as citizens, uh, so that there's a uh, uh, an effort. Uh, being made to to uh, finding some ways of of bringing something positive into the into the into the circumstances into the into the society uh, uh, into the culture uh, it's 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 so uh, uh, it's so important uh, you know even and I think it's 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 you know say having uh, a, a person. Um, like President Trump, it, you know, it's easy to, to, uh, you know, it's an easy target, and uh, but it's uh, uh, sometimes those easy targets aren't very helpful in in uh, uh, finding skillful ways of of uh, directing our energy and attention. <laughs> Yeah, those those are the major ones. The major ones. <laughs> so I know a few of them, and I know that some of them are widely known, like yeah. killing, like stealing, or engaging yeah. in sexual misconduct. And you've mentioned a few other um, uh, other ones that I didn't know, like not storing food and yeah. um, preventing drunk driving. There's several like that. You know, not handling money, um, but people do tend to know about. On, well, on cer certainly in terms of monastic living, um, there's uh, you know there's there's a lot of the precepts are around um, the re the relationship with the lay community, so that both establishing a, a, again it sort of bonds of trust. And, and not taking advantage of uh, the generosity or the, um, the requisites that have been offered. So then, there's, then it extends into a lot of precepts around uh, looking after uh, uh, the requisites that are given both of the, say whether it's medicines or food or, or lodgings or, or robes. So there's actually a lot of precepts around that. So it's it's what it's doing is establishing uh, these relationships of uh, respect and trust um, between the the monastic community and the lay community, and that has a huge effect uh, when those are sort of taken in turn. What is the spirit behind it? Uh, I mean, one is the the mindfulness that you gain in being attentive and careful in one's use of the requisites, but then also the the uh, uh, that, that establishing of a uh, of a, both a harmonious and trustful relationship between the the monastic communities and the lay community. Uh, so th those are those are 
precepts, and there's, you know, there's lots of them that come in different ways, and it, 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 and it does uh, really establish this, like a, a really trustworthy community and, and trustworthy human being, because we, you know, we have to internalize, it's not just the community, it's we have to internalize that within ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's no precept against having a wrong thought. <laughs> you can't mandate that, uh, which is very different from Catholicism. <laughs> um, they, uh, um, yes, every two weeks, uh, the, on the full moon and the new moon, uh, the monastic community gathers and we do a recitation of our rules of training. Uh, so those 227 rules are recited and, uh, and one monk who has committed it to memory will recite it. And uh, so I mean, it's a ceremony, it's a ritual, but before enga and, and it, uh, engaging in that or beginning it, then y you have to clear off any offenses. And you also have to, you can't confess the same, if, if there's, if say, if two monks have committed the same offense, they can't confess it to each other. So before you do a confession, then you have to sort of say, well, what, what, did I do? And then the monk, uh, and a monk said, oh, well, I did that too. So then I'll have to confess to another monk. So there's a, uh, there is a, uh, a, uh, it's like a formal procedure of, of going through one's offenses and, and, uh, and, and letting others know and then doing a confession. And, uh, and, uh, and, it, and it's just, her, uh, it's heard by the other monk who then, responds in a way of saying, oh, okay, very well, determined to do better in the future. So it's, it's like a, it's, it's on a certain level, it's a ritual, but it's also a, a developing of a, an awareness around the, the rule. So it isn't just going in and listening to the ceremony and getting out as quick as you can. Um, so there is a, 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 a uh, and, and like during this three month period uh, of the summertime, which coincides with the, say like in Thailand or in Asia of the, the, the rains retreat, uh, monsoon season, then uh, we go through the, it's like the, the, the whole community, monastic community. Uh, we study the, the, the rules of training. Um, uh, we go through. Uh, we we tend not to go through them all in terms of uh, because it's in, in three months you can't do it. But over like we'll take a we'll focus on something this year, but then next year we'll focus on something else. And there, there's some that are really important that you really want to make sure people understand. But uh, but so that that uh, uh, it's a uh, say a period of group study and learning so that everybody's got a good grasp of, of what they are and how to use them. Especially when you're in a, uh, uh, in a uh, uh, say like in a, in a group like that. Uh, and what I do is um, I tend to get uh, the, uh, the, the more junior members of the community to do the presentations. Uh, say rather than me sitting up and rattling off the rules, I mean that that's just really boring. And uh, uh, but uh, getting the younger members and then splitting it up so that it's not too much for one person, and then they'll study them and then present it, and it's and it's they've got to learn it, and then 
people be asking questions. So it's 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 in, very interactive. And people learn a lot from it. Um, so it's a uh, uh, it's a part of our uh, uh, say yeah uh, almost a defining feature of our lifestyle really. So they're getting a good grasp of these. Is you know to say rules is is sort of saying you know it's like you know do this don't do that which you know it is on a certain level but but it's it's also it has so many applications and implications that that uh, though having the uh, that good understanding of the kind of the structure that holds together a monastic life. Uh, and there's a clarity there, then, yeah, the, 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 the mind, the heart is really able to settle much more clearly. There's a confidence that arises in what one's doing. So then that's really helpful for one's ongoing, say, meditation and, and investigation. Um, it is 3.33, which is uh, uh, it's a time for uh, you all to have a break, a bit of a rest, walk around, and then uh, 4 o'clock you'll gather for council over in the hall over there. So uh, you know, feel free to uh, get yourselves settled. Everybody else knows that you're going to be there, so, I mean, in terms of the monastics, so you won't be bothered, it'll be empty there, and it's closed off, so, okay, great. <laughs>